The first time I had any real contact with cattle was the day I brought Bruiser, Kobe, and Kobe Whiteface home. They were three-month-old orphans and still needed their bottles. As the boys grew up together, they were never far from one another. They were pals. I marveled at their friendship, which was so different from horses. They had no discernible pecking order, although sometimes they reminded me of a pod of eighth-grade football players socking each other in the stomach or crashing into one another to get food, water, or minerals. They never bit or chased each other around like the horses do, but just clobbered each other with great headbutts, friendly, jostling, cow-style. One night, when they were nineteen months old, I had a sick feeling something was wrong. I set off to, to check the moos, as we'd come to call them. They were together at the far reaches of the back pasture. All was fine. The next night I had that same nagging fear. Something was wrong. Sure enough, up the canyon I found a sixteen-foot gate ripped from its hinges. Dead and bloated, twenty feet beyond the gate lay Kobe Whiteface. His moo friends looked plaintively at me. You human being, they said. You make Kobe Whiteface get up. My heart sank. In spite of bottle feeding them for months when they were babies, they had never had much use for me. Now they wanted me to do something I could not do. Make Kobe Whiteface get up, they pleaded. I can't do it, boys, I said. I am not God and Kobe Whiteface is not Lazarus. I cannot make him get up. I had no idea Moose could feel such a bond. Their sorrow was gut-wrenching. We added another set of cattle a week or so later. Kobe and Bruiser had a distraction from the missing member of their trio. Now they had a real bull, Willie, a cow and a calf to pal around with. Willie settled in and kindly adopted his step-steers. And another week later, we brought in a couple more cows, a few more steers, and a calf. The herd was twelve strong now. Again I marveled that there was no aggressive pecking order. There was great celebration as Moose spent the better part of their day exploring all fifteen acres of their pasture at a lope. My purpose for raising cattle was for beef production. I do not use pesticides, herbicides, or GMO seeds on my land. I attempt to eat organically grown food and, and avoid any GMO-laced food. I'm even more strict about feeding my animals non-GMO foods. I make every effort to provide a rich social environment for my animals so that they live out their lives in stress and chemical-free world. And, when, and my goal when they die is that they have a quick, painless, and stress-free death. This was accomplished when we slaughtered Kobe. We placed him in the pasture adjacent to the one his moo herd had spent the last night in. We fed them close to one another so he would not feel abandoned. Prior to the slaughter truck's arrival in the morning, we ushered the herd up to a pasture where they would be unable to see their friend die and be butchered. Kobe died, eating the only bite of grain he'd had in 18 months. But what I failed to attend to was the fact that the sight of Kobe's death would contain smells of his demise. And Willie, our bull, wailed with pain so excruciating it brings me to tears now even now to tell you. I felt as though I were attending a funeral in a culture where people pull their hair and beat their chests and cry in great wails of grief. Am I lay overlaying some anthropomorphic interpretation? It is my observation that Willie has provided his herd a quiet, competent leader. He is patient with the young moose. I don't think I've ever seen him smash his head into the rib cage of a fellow moo. He's what natural horseman Mark Rashid, author of, among other titles, a horse of a different color, has referred to as a natural leader, a leader others follow because he has great judgment and obvious confident competence. I believe that part of Willie's grief came from his knowing that he had let the herd down by allowing Kobe to die on his watch, die what was obviously a violent and terrible death he had committed what he considered an unforgivable breach of responsibility and I too feel, feel that I have failed the herd. Although I have found that the moo herd has not assigned this guilty sentence to Willie or to me, we share the knowledge that we fail to protect and defend the herd from physical and emotional hurts. I confess this to you, the viewer, because I want you to feel, as we do, the responsibility that we all have to know that the meat we eat was harvested in a humane manner, humane in the manner in which the animal lived and died, and humane in its consideration of that animal's friends. 
You may not know this, but our small farms are on the verge of extinction. A gross percentage of our meat is produced in factory farms where no, and I do mean not a single iota of concern is given to the animal's life or death beyond that which is required by bureaucrats who determine what is meant by humane treatment. I assure you, no animal on a factory farm or feedlot is given the quality of life or death that is afforded by a small farmer who cares deeply for his animals, their health, their emotional and physical welfare. I want you, the viewer, to see that an animal, even a big stupid cow, has emotional capacities unfathomable to the viewer of Safeway's ground beef on sale this week for $1.89 a pound. Please support your local farmer. Ah! <gasps>